Good morning, my friends. Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. It is Thursday, November 2nd, and we're experiencing a heat wave. It's warmed up by 7 degrees. It's 26 degrees out there, which is still uh, about 6 degrees below freezing. <laughs> that equates to uh, minus 3.33 Celsius. So it's, it's still pretty darn cold. If, uh, if I could make a wish for winter, I would wish it wouldn't get any colder than this. This is cold enough, and uh, at this temperature, I can handle the firewood situation, even though it's still a huge, huge effort. But at, this, at these temperatures, it's, it's not horrible. I mean, well, it would be horrible to everybody else on the planet, but <laughs> you know, compared to what I'm used to, this would, this would be doable. Um, once it drops below about 26, and even really 26 is a little cool. If it was like in 28, you know, thir you know, around 30, where it's still freezing, but it's just a little below freezing, that's not too bad to deal with. Once it drops below that, that's when you start really burning the wood. I mean, it, you really burn the wood. But anyway, uh, be that as it may, we're holding our own right now. I cut a little more firewood yesterday and you'll see a little video on that. Plus you'll see a little short video on a frozen creek that I just thought I'd make you a comparison and talk about that just a, for just a few seconds. Uh, <clears throat> as a subscriber count, we broke another thousand. So we're at 101,021. So uh, 101,021 subscribers, 1905 growth over the last 28 days, which is still dropping slowly, but at least it's growing. It's not going down. Uh, it, we're not, we don't have negative numbers anyway. Uh, Cash was ill yesterday, so Cash is my 10-year-old uh, music student, and uh, he was ill, so he didn't get his lesson yesterday. He's doing really good. He made real strides uh, last week, uh, or was it the week before? I think it was the week before. Anyway, he made real strides um, on his Johnny Cash tune that I've been teaching him, and uh, I really was almost ready to give up and try something different. Because, but uh, he he finally, for some reason, it must have clicked, and he he finally got it, and uh, he did really good on his last lesson. So I'm anxious to see how he's doing now. Um. I got a message from uh, YouTube, Google, whoever, the powers that be, that the plaque is on its way. Woohoo! <laughs> so apparently I'm going to actually get one of the silver play button plaques and we'll unveil that here on a vlog. While I'm thinking about that, uh, from now on, uh, starting tomorrow, I'm not going to call it a shop talk on Friday. I'm just going to call it another vlog because the format's basically the same now. And there's no point to confuse the issue. So I, every day is just going to be a vlog. But you're invited on every day to ask questions about musical instruments, on building, repairing, and all that. So, and I, you know, I typically do answer those questions on a daily basis anyway. So uh, feel free to ask any of those technical questions on any given day. But uh, on Fridays, uh, you know, we may, you know, I'm not saying that I'll always make those a little bit uh, bigger or more content, but I, I will try to always make the Friday a little bit extra special. But th we're just going to call them vlogs just for the sake of confusion because everything is really the same format at this point. Um, let's see. Uh, I got another new tool. <laughs> they just keep coming. And I think there's more on the way, actually. What is this one? Well, this one is a, let me read this to you. This takes college education. I'm glad I, I'm glad I have a uh, college education because this is a bilateral laser distance meter, <laughs> a DM-262. It does work pretty cool. It's, uh, again, I don't know if I'd call it user-friendly. Again, you, you got it. It's got a pretty thick book with it. And you got to know all the little details. And these buttons just are not real obvious what they are. You know, and I just, I don't know. I, th I still think, had I been on their design team, it could be easier than this. But anyway, it does work pretty good. I I'm going to power it on here with the power on button. 
and you can see there it's got a screen it's washing out you can't even see I don't think the stuff that you can't see anything on that screen that's weird because it it doesn't have much but there's some dashes across there and it's telling you that it's going to be measuring in feet and inches so then if I press uh, just like hold it here it's shooting a laser out this way and it's shooting a laser out that way and I'll tell you how big my shop is here let me get it approximately level Whoops, I think I missed, I don't think I did it quick enough. It's 24.179 feet. So there you go. And that's about right, I would say. Especially considering I was going into the window on this side here. So, you know, it's a little bit bigger than 24 feet because of that. But anyway, the, the point is it's pretty cool. You can also use it from one end to the other. In other words, you could butt this up against a wall if you wanted to and measure to the other side or something like that. Um, where I think I'm going to try to use this, and you know, I've got the moisture meter to make a video about also, where I'm going to try to incorporate the moisture meter and this into one video where I am um, cutting... Uh, trees down for lumber and I'm going to try this I don't know if I can make this make sense or not cut logs into certain lengths with this um I don't know if that's going to work but I'm going to try it and, and you know we'll just see but it would be kind of cool to be able to have this uh out when I'm logging like to like to check the height of a tree you know like if I could just aim it on a limb or something and then I'll know is that tree big enough for what I want to do you know that kind of thing so I don't know if that'll work or not but we'll see. So, but anyway, that's another video coming down the road eventually. <laughs> Just one more thing on the to-do list. It's only one thing. <laughs> Wait till you hear my to-do list. And it's not that long. I mean, I could definitely add to it. I could make it two or three times as long as it is. But uh, it's still a lot to do. Um, okay, so that was the uh, bilateral, <laughs> bilateral laser distance meter. Okay, the next thing on my list here is to show you some old photographs that I've got laid out here. These are on the wall in the shop. I was just passing through there this morning. I thought, hey, you guys would probably like to see this. This first photograph is my uncle Don Brown and the Ozark Mountain Trio. And before you start telling me that I look like Don Brown or he looks like me or whatever... There's no resemblance <laughs> because we're not married. I mean, we're not, that's not right. We're not <laughs> related. He was married to my uh, dad's sister. So uh, that's Don there, of course. And uh, th these three guys in the uh, dark outfits are the Ozark Mountain Trio. And then the guy over here on the other side, holding the fiddle, that's George Ports. So in this, in this configuration, the, the band name would be Don Brown, George Ports, and the Ozark Mountain Trio. And um, George was a national fiddle champion at one time. And uh, he, incidentally, a uh, bit of trivia, played on my first album, or my first CD. George played the fiddle on that also. And... Um, that first album I put out was called It's in the Wind. And uh, anyway, so just so you know who, who actually did the fiddling on that album was a national fiddle champion, George Ports. And uh, Don's holding one of, it, you know, one of his earlier mandolins there. That's not his Lloyd Lore, of course. And here's my, I guess really one of my, I guess this is probably the first iteration of my band um over well let's see over here on the banjo that is larry thomas and larry has passed away larry's the one when i rewrote the black diamond strings i said uh you know larry showed me how to uh, play the g run or something like that is what the words were in the song and so Larry was a, a big part of me playing music he was very patient and helped me out when i first started um this is Mike Brown on the bass, and Mike was a really, really good bass player. Really good bass player. And, uh, of course, that's me on the mandolin there. Looks like me, doesn't it? You know, same color hair, everything. Uh, 
And that's Bill Eagleburger. And Bill was a really good guitar player, uh, especially rhythm and uh, very traditional guitar type player. Um, Bill was also a pretty good harmony singer and stuff. So uh, anyway, that was my first iteration of my uh, Rosa Stringworks band. Here, you know, I wrote the song called Vine Covered Church. And that song, well, <laughs> it's nothing to brag about, but it's brought me more royalties than any other song I ever wrote. Maybe Grandpa's Old Fiddle, I'm not really sure, or maybe even Phantom 614 brought in some, but, but I'm pretty sure Vine Covered Church brought in the most royalties, which uh, would make anybody rich. I mean, I probably got a total of $150 out of it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> really nothing to speak of, but but it did bring in some royalties. And, you know, I think the biggest check I ever got on it was $75, something like that. But this is the vine-covered church, or a picture of it. And you can see the vines on the church, I think. If I can get the glare off of it, it it's just... I'm trying to hold it in a way where the glare will go away. But you can see the vines all over it. And now keep in mind, and, and I, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this, I... That church, I basically only saw it maybe once or twice, and both times, it I was flying down the highway at you know basically seventy miles an hour, and I just glanced at it like that, and from that it just burned an image in my brain. And the story goes when I was trying to write the song, I really wasn't trying to write it about this church. I was actually trying to write a song about a one-room schoolhouse that happened to be on my wife's family's farm. It was, um, and, and a lot of the description that I mention in that song is describing that one-room schoolhouse. But, I, but every time I would sit down and try to write the song about the one-room schoolhouse, that church would come into my brain every time. And keep in mind, I only saw it like twice and it was just a quick image just going down the highway, you know. But yet, every single time that I would try to write the, the school song, and I, I, I tried for months, and typically that doesn't take me very long. Typically, I can write a song in a very short amount of time, an hour or less or a day or two at the most. But this was taken months. And every single time that little church would block it out in my brain. And I couldn't get anything written. And um, so finally, after about six months, I just gave in and said, you know, maybe God's trying to tell me something here, you know. And I just switched to the Vine Covered Church and instantly I had a song. It, was, it didn't take any time at all. I had the song written. It's the only song I've uh, written that a... Um, you know, a national group recorded. The Witcher Brothers were a national act back in the 90s. Um, I don't know how long they lasted, but they were, you know, they hit, they had some charted songs and things at one time. But anyway, uh, you know, and then the, uh, the odd thing about that song, about the Vine Covered Church, was every single time i played it and i am not exaggerating about this you think there's no way it could have happened every time it happened every single time and i'm not exaggerating the first year i played it every single time we were on stage and every time i played it on stage somebody would come up and tell me a, a story about that church and we were in dodge city kansas and a guy came up and told me a story about that church and uh, some of the stories that I vaguely remember was that, you know, my grandpa went to that church, you know, and they, uh, and they played music there, believe it or not. And, and one guy says, you, you probably don't realize it, but they actually play bluegrass music there, too, you know, and that, that kind of stories. So I, I kept hearing those kinds of stories. But, but the most unique story was the first time I played it. And... Um, Keep in mind now, it took me six months to write this song and then another month to get the band, you know, up to speed on it because it's, it's not hard to play, but it changes chords quickly weird, in the, especially in the chorus. So it takes a little bit of getting used to, you know, to, to play the song. 
Well, anyway, uh, so the very first time we played it on stage, we were down in Farmington, Missouri, and we were in an auction barn where they actually have, you know, horse and cattle auctions. And we were on the center stage there where the auctioneer would typically sit, and, we, and the, the crowd was in the arena around there. It's a pretty big auction barn, actually, and we had a pretty good big crowd that day. And so it was the very, very first time I played the song, and believe it or not, that's in the general area where the church used to be. And um, so I, you know, I, I was fat, dumb, and happy, didn't know anything about the church, really. And so I played the song, and after we got off stage, a man came up to me and grabbed me by the arm. This was the very first story that anybody told me about it. He goes, son, I, I love your song about that church. I said, but you, you do know you got to change the words, right? change the words? Why would I need to change the words, you know? I, no, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, oh, you don't know? I said, I don't know what? And he says, uh, well, they just tore that church down yesterday. That sent chills up my neck. I mean, it really did because it was like, like my song was to keep that little church alive, you know? It was so weird how it, the timing happened like that after six months but anyway that was pretty cool and like i said every single time i played it from that point on for a whole year somebody would tell me a story about that that church it was crazy i never seen anything like it so i guess it was meant to be is all i can tell you all right so that was that picture here's the last picture do you recognize anybody in there <laughs> well, the most prominent person, I guess, would be that girl right there with the light brown hair. That is Rhonda Vincent. That is Grace, Emery's little sister. And Emery was, I mean, Grace was only about 12 at that time, I think. And that's Emery. And Emery had just had my second granddaughter and her first child, uh, Emery's first child, it was, her name is Mary. She's the basketball star. She's the one that has my giant hands. In fact, uh, Rhonda carried Mary up on stage during that, that particular uh, concert, uh, bluegrass show. This was at the Sally Mountain show, I think, uh, Rhonda's own show. And of course, that's me in the background. This is uh, Emery's mother on bass, and her name was Renee, and Renee was a great bass player, just really enjoyed having her, and she was a great singer, as you've heard her sing on my channel too. And then, of course, that's Leon, the banjo player, and he was playing dobro on that particular song, obviously. And Leon was, Leon's really, really good on everything. I mean, he can literally, and I'm no exaggeration, play circles around me on a mandolin. Uh, and I'm not kidding. I mean, he can, he makes me sound like I'm, don't even know what I'm doing. Um, so that's the name of that tune. I just thought you might get a kick out of seeing those old pictures and photographs that are on my wall in there. Um, let me go through my to-do list. I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Um, I had to mail out the, the last two prizes. I got that done, so that one's checked off of the list. I still need to balance my statements, my checkbooks, and all that stuff. I got to get in there and get caught up on some paperwork. So I got to get caught up on the accounting. Um, and then uh, I got to fix that fiddle for Gina. I got to set up the auction for those two fiddles. I have to make videos on three things. I got to make them on that moisture meter. I got to make them on the torque wrench. I got to make them on that new laser distance meter. And on the water wheel project, I need to just decide how I'm going to build that building. You know, do I want to make it a single or a two story? Um, you know, uh, do I want to, you know, and then I need to get out there and cut the lumber for the siding. I, I think after seeing that last picture that the fellow sent me, I think instead of the lap siding, which I really think would deteriorate anyway, I really do think it would. I think it wouldn't hold up as long. Um, I think I've decided to go ahead and do the board and batten siding. Um, it's not as airtight. Well, neither is the other one. Really, neither one of them is very airtight. But, and it doesn't really have to be on this building. 
But I think I'm going to do the board and batten siding. Um, that's the vertical boards with the little thin strip of wood covering the seams. Uh, and then let's see, number, point number eight here is I've got to cut and haul more firewood, as always. Um, uh, i got to fix an electric sprayer. Sue has one of those backpack sprayers that's actually electric, has an electric pump on it. Well, the only problem with it originally was the hose had broken and the nozzle had broken. So I, I got a new hose and a new nozzle, put that on there, and then the sprayer quit working. <laughs> Wouldn't you know? I mean, it was working fine up until that point. So I don't know if I did something or what, but I got to take that all apart again and figure out why that's not spraying. Um, I'm waiting on the parts for my fireplace heater, so I've got to finish that up. Uh, I got to fix the screen on my smartphone oh i hate that this got broke it's you, again you can't hardly see the cracks but there's cracks running all over the place now um i don't know if you can see it you can see it a little bit but i hate having a broken screen and this it was in my holster and i rolled over on it while i was working on the uh, dodge ram truck i was under the dash trying to fix something and I rolled over, and the instant I rolled, I heard it crack, and I knew I did it. So, got to fix that. So, I'm waiting on parts on that, too. All right, here's the Frozen Creek video. Uh, that, that concludes my uh, to-do list for the moment. Now, is that all, everything I got to do? Heck, no. Those are just the big items. I mean, like, you know, you notice that Dobro thing wasn't on there. There's a million things that aren't on there. Those are just the things I need to get done fairly quickly. Okay, so here's a video on the frozen creek. I don't know if this is going to show up or not, but there's ice on this creek. You can see the air bubbles there, perhaps. Um, but this is a thin layer of ice. Yeah, you can kind of see it there, I think. Anyway, look at the pond. There's not one little bit of ice on the pond. There are two reasons for that. Number one, this is a deep pond, so it's going to take a while for it to get cold enough. But number two, it's spring-fed, and the water coming in stays at a constant temperature. Now, it's not very much water coming in, I'll be honest. So, the amount of water coming in right now isn't really enough to keep the temperature up. But when the water does come in pretty fast, this pond like never does freeze over. It's only frozen over a couple of times in all the years we've owned the place. And I think only two times thick enough that we could actually walk on it. All the rest of the times it was a very, very thin skim of ice, if any. Yeah, that, it takes a lot. I mean, super cold temperatures. Like if it stayed in the teens for about 10 days, uh, it would probably have enough ice on it to maybe walk on it. Uh, but it's got to be really cold for a very extended period of time uh, before it's strong enough or thick enough to actually walk on. The other reason that the creek froze is because, you know, typically you think of a creek being moving water and it's not going to freeze as easily as the pond. But in our case, it's the exact opposite because of the certain factors. Now, having said that, the spring is all, I mean, the creek is also spring fed. So you would think, well, it wouldn't freeze either, but, and it doesn't freeze easily, but that was just happened to be a shallow, uh, fairly still pool of water and that's why that froze in that area because it was shallow and uh, fairly still in that sp specific spot so that's the difference there here's a little video about four minutes worth on some of the firewood stuff i did yesterday well my friends we're back here in the walnut tree field and over there you can maybe make it out a little bit there's some wood that i left in the laying down yesterday that I'll pick up on the way out. But right now we're going to cut up this walnut top. This is just the top out of a walnut tree and we're gonna cut it up for firewood. Well, there's what she looks like all sawed up. It don't take long to saw up that much wood. That's not a very big pile of wood. I'll show you how much that it fills up the trailer here in just a moment after I throw it on the trailer.
Well, here's what the spot looks like now with all the wood on the trailer. You can still see some bark laying there and that bark is just gonna rot away. It also makes, you know, ground cover for uh, the little voles and mice and things that are out here, which is perfectly fine to leave it. And uh, by next spring, that'll pretty much be gone. And or if you hit it with a uh, brush hog, it'll be gone for sure. I just see one little piece laying here that I didn't notice. This is not much, but it's a piece. And like I told you, every piece counts when it comes to that wood furnace. So here's what it looks like on the trailer. You can see half the trailer's empty, a little more than half. It's a little more than a third of a load. But uh, I've got about that much more down there to pick up. So we'll go pick that up and then we'll see how full the trailer is. So here's what we've got laying on the ground here, as you can see. There's quite a bit here, actually, probably as much as we've got on there already. I'll probably have to stack the bigger pieces and then I'll just throw the smaller pieces on and I think it'll fill up the trailer pretty good. So I'll show you what it looks like after I get done loading all this. Well, the entire area is cleaned up, got her all picked up, got to reload all my tools there. But you can see it almost filled the trailer up completely full. This area back here could have been loaded a little heavier, a little more full. But you can see the springs on the trailer are pretty flat. So it's a, it's a good heavy load. Not quite as heavy as the load I hauled yesterday, I don't think. But between that load and this load, that'll probably get me through the weekend at least. Uh, well, especially since it's supposed to warm back up. If it was going to stay cold, like 19 overnight and all that, no, this wouldn't make it to Monday. But I think it will because uh, it's supposed to warm up. A lot of work. I realize it. Nobody knows it better than me. So here's what... Whoops. I cut that off a little early, and the only way to show it to you now is to show you the whole thing again. So I'm just going to skip that. But all I did was I just piled that up on top of the other pile there next to the wood furnace. And um, anyway, it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty good pile. It, it, I think it, the, if, had I let it play and let you see it, you could see that it was definitely more than a cord of wood. In other words, you couldn't stack it all tightly in a four by four by eight foot space. It's, it's more than a cord of wood. And honestly, that I, I know for sure if, if the temperatures stay around, you know, low, I mean, the upper teens, low twenties, there's no way it would last more than about three to maybe four days at the very most. So it's just the way it is. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, just for people that are new that don't get all this and, you know, I, I get all these questions and comments like you need to, you need to insulate and you need to do all this. Well, and I've already mentioned that I've already done all that stuff. All of it's been done. Trust me, it's been done very well too. And it doesn't matter because you got 7,000 square feet of concrete that is sucking in cold from everywhere. And uh, it's not, you know, there's no heat sink or anything. That's the reason it's so hard to heat. But on the other converse side of that is that it's very easy to cool in the hot summertime. Um, like you could, you know, I, I'm, if you had a house that's, say a thousand square feet, um, you could, you could probably spend, I don't know, what, 200, $300 a month cooling that in, in, a, in a really hot time frame. I can cool my whole house that, you know, it, uh, I would say that the actual living space in the house is around 6,000 square feet. You know, the concrete is, like I said, 7,000 square feet by my calculations. But uh, just say that there's a 7,000 or 6,000 square feet of living space. I can cool that whole house for the same price. You can probably cool your 1,000 square foot house. It's easy to cool. It costs like nothing. I mean, it just compared to the size. But to heat it, you're paying for it big time. And just so you understand also, it's all, the house does have uh, gas furnaces also. It has the two largest gas furnaces made for residential. It's got uh, two Linux pulse furnaces. Uh, and I'm just going by what these furnace people have told me. I don't know anything about that stuff. But they, I'm just 
regurgitating what they said. They said these are the two largest uh, residential furnaces you can get. And, um, and when they kick on, <laughs> and I'm not kidding you about this, I can be at the far end of my property and I can hear those furnaces kick on because they've got exhaust uh, manifolds coming out, the, out of the roof out, outside and it sounds like a big diesel truck. <laughs> it just is incredible, the sound that it makes. You can't really hear it inside the house, but you can sure hear it outside as it goes down that valley. And, uh, you know, and then just again, for the record, um, the uh, propane, you know, it's got a thousand gallon propane tank. And I, you can believe what you want, but I know for sure that a thousand gallon propane tank, when it's really cold, won't last a whole month. You know, and just think what that costs. So you're talking thousands of dollars a month to heat the house. And I mean, literally thousands of dollars a month to heat the house if you use propane. The way I do it, now keep in mind, it's a ton of work. I get it. You know, you don't have to tell me it's a ton of work. Nobody knows that better than me. It's a ton of work. But essentially, I'm heating it for free. I mean, yeah, there's fuel costs for the chainsaw. There's fuel costs for the tractor. But other than that, it's basically free except for my time, of course, and the hard work. But, you know, that's why I haven't gone bankrupt here. Every single person since the original owners, and I don't know if the original owners went bankrupt here or not. I have no idea. But every person since the original owners has gone bankrupt here because they were heating it with gas. Yeah, and there were two... Uh, oil companies, you know, propane companies, whatever you want to call them. They're MFA oil is what I think of. But anyway, there were two different companies at the closing when we bought this farm to foreclose on our, to collect their money for the heating. Yeah, so that'll give you some idea. This is not the, this is not your average place to heat. <laughs> So no matter what you think, I just want to get it out there on the table so people, you know, because I just, I'm trying to cut off those comments because I get them every single year that I start talking about this. So you'll just have to understand that we're not dealing with apples and apples like you were, like your typical people think about. Okay, moving on to comments here. Um, let's see, Zane Naz. Uh, greetings, Jerry and family. Thank you for sharing your outstanding experience. Best regards from England. Oh, and a bunch of thumbs up. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. Carolyn Fike was the second one to check in. Kathy Voltz, um, good morning. And she's in Palm Beach, Florida, and just rubbing it in. She's 79 degrees down there. <laughs> Don't tell my wife that because... Oh my gosh, my wife wants to move every single winter. She really does. Joe Knoll, uh, good morning, Jerry. I feel on the wood cutting. It's cold in North Carolina. Yep, yeah, I get, yeah, I get it. Um, moving down here. After we went live, uh, first question mark. Well, Jan Peters was the first one from Germany. Cool. Glad to have you here, Jan. And, uh, and then there's two yards was the second one, and then James Cop has a or Cope. I'm going to say cop. I, I can't remember now. I, he probably told me how to say that. Morning from San Leon, Texas. Warmer here. <laughs> yeah, I bet you. Um, and then Terry Ant has question mark. Says, just an observation while watching you level the foundation for the wheel building. I couldn't help but notice you went about leveling the rock base like you would level frets on the guitar. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not very different. There's a lot of parallels in all the kinds of different work that I do when I think about it. And in fact, I, I you know, some of you probably think, oh, he's just saying this for the video. But I've said this before, and I think some of you have watched a lot of stuff. You'll hear me, you have heard me say this. But one of the things that I definitely incorporated into my instrument work was, believe it or not, building fences. We used to, dad, my dad, he, he never owned much ground ever. He never did. In fact, I think four acres was all, that, as far as I know, that was all he ever owned. And that was in uh, uh, Baldwin, Missouri, Kerr's Mill. And we had a big barn on that four acres. In fact, the barn took up 
you know, a good third of the property, probably, um, or quarter of the property anyway. Well, anyway, um, he had leased pastures everywhere. I mean, he had a bunch of them. You know, I don't even know how many, maybe six or seven, eight or ten. You know, I just don't know. But we would, we would have to go out on all these different properties and fix the fences or build fences when they didn't have fences. And the thing that we did was, uh, and my dad was a pretty big stickler on this. He wanted those fence, fence lines straight, especially since it was somebody else's property. So you want to make it look good. And so he wanted those, those fence posts in line. Well, it was my job to tell him if he was in line or not. And if I didn't get it in line, he didn't like that. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm looking down. I, I would be at one end of the fence, and I'd, I could line up all the posts, and, and he'd be back there with a post getting ready to drive it in the ground or whatever. And I would tell him, you know, that way or this way or whatever. And pretty much they were in a perfect line when we were done. Well, I incorporated that. And you've seen me do it a million times, looking down the fretboard. I can look down a fretboard. I can tell you. I can. I, and I, I know it sounds like a brag, but I'm not kidding. You know, I've, I've had a gazillion people in the shop that have seen me do it face to face, and I can look down the fretboard and go, "That fret there's high, or that fret there's low, or whatever." And I can put my finger right on it, and then we'll take the file across there, and it proves it. It proves it correct. And it's just something I learned to do as a kid, you know. And I can do it. And I don't know that everybody can do it, but I think you could if you practiced, you know. So that's why I never bothered with a fret leveling tool or all these, you know, these rulers and stuff. I just never did have to use that. It just, it worked for me to just do it the other way. So anyway, that's, but, but what you're saying there, there's a lot of parallels. And that was just one of the, of the real obvious parallels was fence building compared to fret leveling. Um... Moving on down, let's look. I'm looking for question marks. I do see a question mark here on RB. It says, is that luthier wood behind you? Uh, yeah, pretty much everything on this wall could, could have wound up in an instrument at one time or another. Um, you know, um, in fact, I'm sure there's more than enough wood there to build probably at least two more instruments, maybe three. Um, and that would be like mandolins and or guitars. Even violins, possibly. Let's see. Moving down. The next one is Gary Smythe from the UK. Good afternoon, Jerry. Question about the water wheel. Looking at the wall, the water runs down by the right. But to see it from your road, your road is on the left. Okay. I'm not quite sure I get you there. Um... See, when you, here's the way I think of it, and you know, I, I'm, actually it's this direction, if I'm really doing it correctly, I'm pulling in the property, there's two big pillars are here, on the left is the water wheel and the water and the, and the house. Again, I've got to decide, one story or two stories. I kind of think there's room, and I kind of think that it wouldn't be obtrusive to have it two stories. But I don't know yet. I'm still, still voting on that. I don't know yet. But anyway, so the water wheel is on the left. And you'll see, as soon as you pull through my gate, you'll see the water wheel and the, wa and the house right there. And the water wheel will be spinning. I just think that's going to be a really cool visual as you enter the property. It's that first impression thing, you know. And I just think it's going to leave a really cool first impression. And then the big pond is on your left there too. Now, come, now, from the other side, you won't really be able to see the water wheel very well, or if at all, probably won't be able to see it at all. If, you know, if you've left the building all the way open, you could see it. And we, at one time, we were considering doing that, but I don't really want to do that. And the reason I don't want to do that is because I want to have the actual uh, extra storage space to put in, you know, fishing poles, tackle boxes, and things like that, and just leave them in there. Um, and then again, we're probably going to put another little pavilion there, perhaps for a picnic table and stuff like that later. So anyway, that's my vision for it. Uh, uh, as much of the vision as I have at the moment. Like I said, I still don't know whether it's one, one story or two stories. 
And I had never even considered two stories until my wife mentioned it. So, yeah, I still don't know. I just don't know. Terry Ann says, thank you for sharing the photos and related stories. You enjoyed it. Well, good. Um, <clears throat> Tom Armstrong, I, could, I would be happy to drive down and take more pictures of that little mill in uh, Rockingham, Vermont, if need be. Well, Tom, I, don't real, I appreciate you very much sending me the photo because it did make me rethink the sighting issue. I really did, I was kind of looking forward to doing lap sighting, cause I, mostly because I just wanted to saw it on the sawmill and, and wanted to learn how to do that and all that kind of thing. I was looking forward to something new, you know, if you, if you will, because I always like new stuff. That's just me. I've always been that way. I always, you know, that, that was why the, the day they walked into Southwestern Bell and they said, hey, we're going to start computerizing things. Do we have any volunteers to work on computers? My hand was the first one up. <laughs> you know, I, I like something new every day, you know. Um, so uh, that's why I was kind of looking forward to doing the lap sighting. But after you sent me the photo, and, and, and I knew this in the back of my mind anyway, that the old mills were almost all board and batten sighting. At least they were here in Missouri that I've seen. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying they all were, but a lot of them were, and I'm sure some of them had lap sighting too. But anyway, I got to thinking, you know, that is the older rustic look. And not only that, and that's just part of it is the look. The other part of it is I do think it'll be sturdier, stronger, uh, last longer, all that too. So that's why I've decided to go to the board and batten. But no, I don't think you need to take any more pictures or anything. I appreciate what you did there. You did make me rethink it again. And uh, that, that's all that's necessary. I pretty much got the whole vision of the whole thing in my head. The only vision part I'm not sure of is one story or two stories. And that's really about all I'm worried about right now. And I'm still thinking. And I may still be thinking next week too. You just never know. One of these days I'll go, oh yeah, this is why I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> and then I'll have it figured out. Um, Simon Jardine has one question mark at the end. It says, further to our last short chat about how hard oak is, Jerry, wouldn't it be ideal for a bridge? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, oak's excellent for, for strength for anything. Uh, it's incredibly good for... Uh, you know, like, uh, well, it's, it, it's, it, it, it's really exceptional for trailer beds, for f like flatbed trailers. Oak is just crazy good for that. Like even if you're driving bull bulldozers up on top of it or whatever, uh, yeah, oaks, you can't beat it. It's just, it's the best for that. But often, you know, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm making fun of somebody, but I, in a way, to me, it, it just doesn't even make any sense at all. But I've had a ton of people over the years say, can I use oak for building a guitar? <sighs> it's like, no, do not try to use oak for building. I did actually see one guy who built a electric guitar out of oak, and I swear to you, I am not exaggerating, as the heaviest guitar by at least twice of any other guitar I've ever seen in my life. I mean, the thing was so stupid heavy. It was ridiculous. I just can't imagine why you would want to build anything out of oak. It, I mean, music-wise, you know. It, first of all, it doesn't have any resonance to it. It's just as dead as a doornail when you tap on it. And it's heavier than a brick bat. <coughs> Whatever a brick bat is, I have no idea. But anyway, it's heavier than that. Um, anyway, but it is really good for stuff like you just mentioned there. Uh, building a bridge, it's just perfect for that. Or building uh, anything that really needs strength. So, super strong strength. Oak is perfect. Uh, as long as you pre-drill it if you're going to drive nails. Because <laughs> you cannot drive a nail in it. Uh, you know, like I said, you can, but you really work at it if you do. And, and you really got to be a good carpenter and be able to hit the nail straight to get a nail to go through oak. I'm seriously telling you, you got to know what you're doing to drive a nail through oak. Carolyn Fike, Jerry, I know you have a lot of hard work feeding that furnace, but at least you don't have to split the big logs, do you? Well, no, Carolyn, I, I mean, I... 
you know, on your average, like these logs that I've been getting here, these treetops, typically I don't have to split those. But I do have, I mean, I do run into some uh, big oaks. In fact, we cut one down by my house um, when those guys were here taking out those walnut logs. They knocked down a great big oak. I mean, this thing's huge. It's probably this big around. Well, those kinds of logs, whenever they're bigger than that will go through the door, or, you know, or bigger than I can pick up, then I do split them. And I do have a splitter made for the um, bobcat that's just laying out here that I can hook it right up to my bobcat, walk over. And you've seen me, this in videos last year. You just, you, I can walk over to the log, pick it up and go over the, t over my trailer and split it and it'll bust it in four pieces. Now, if it's a really big log like this big around, well then I'll, I'll the splitter's designed in such a way that I can bust the log in half first, then I can bust it in half again. So in a, now it's into four pieces, four quarters. And then I can take uh, each one of those quarters, pick it up and split it four ways over the trailer. That way I don't have to, once I use that splitter, I don't actually have to touch the wood by hand until I throw it in the furnace. So the splitter is good and bad. I mean, it's, it's good that, you know, I don't even have to touch the wood with my hands when I'm using the splitter. But for this just average daily treetop stuff, the splitter is not really the best option. It's better just do it by hand, even though it's a lot of work. Rick Romanelli, uh, you should have a map of your property on your computer so you can point out to us everything. And yeah, well, that's a good idea, Rick. Um, um, I have made maps of the property. I don't know that I have anything that would transfer easily to a screen, but I'll, I'll definitely consider that. That's a very good idea. I'm glad you said that. Um, I'll, I'll really consider it, and if I can come up with something, you'll see it before too long. But I, I just don't know if I can come up with anything easy. But, but if I can, I will definitely do it. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, Carolyn's talking about uh, she, she must have answered a question for Dottie or somebody. Um, uh, but anyway, about buying firewood. Yeah, there's no way you could afford to buy fire. Well, I mean, you might be able to, but there's no way this boy <laughs> can afford to buy the quantity of firewood I would need. There is no, it's just impossible. First of all, I'd have a tough time finding anybody that could supply it. And I know that sounds stupid because, you know, there's plenty of firewood people. But I, I go by these firewood places that that's what they do for a living. And... And I see their giant piles of firewood. Now, don't get me wrong. They're bigger than what I would use in one year. But I look at their whole operation and all of the wood they got piled up there. And I go, I could use a third of that right now, <laughs> you know, for this coming winter. You know what I'm saying? I would take a third of their business instantly. And I, no, I cannot afford to buy a third of their business. You know what I'm saying? And, and I know you think, oh, you got to be exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. I've started off with 11 dump truck loads of wood. By the way, that's one thing I didn't get on my to-do list. I still got to fix the dump truck. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add that to my to-do list later. <laughs> but anyway, with my dump truck, which is not a huge dump truck. I, you know, I realize that. But it's bigger than my trailer. And you see how, big, how much wood I can haul on that trailer. It's half again as big as the trailer. And I have started off with 11 dump truck loads of wood more than once. I, uh, two years in a row, I think I actually had exactly 11 dump truck loads of wood. And for sure, one of those years, it didn't even make it to Christmas. And uh, so, I mean, that's a lot of wood. <laughs> you know, so uh, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you how much wood I need, man. I'm not, I'm, it's way beyond what you would ever imagine. If you were here, we've had people come out and say, oh, I want to help you with firewood. Well, they get one dose of it and they're going like, yeah, okay, let's go eat. <laughs> Seriously, it's a lot of work. It's super amount of work. It's, it's, I need my head examined. Honestly, it's that much work. It's seriously stupid to do it. It really is. I, I know it is, but I just do it anyway. I can't tell you why exactly, other than I just can't afford to do anything else, other than if we moved into the 
the rental retreat. It'd be life would be simple. All I do is just go over to the thermostat and turn it up, because <laughs> it's electric heat up there and it's very well insulated and it's very you know easy to heat all that. And if I had a wood stove in that up there, I wouldn't use not even one tenth of the wood that I'm using to heat this other house. Not one tenth, and I I'm not exaggerating about that either. In fact, I would say one cord would last at least half a winter in the retreat at just one cord where it only lasts three days up here. <laughs> it's just it's just not apples and apples. I'm seriously telling you, you just don't know how difficult it is to heat that thing. Kathy Vols, Jerry, could you please play and sing Viden Covered Church tomorrow? Well, yeah, I could. We still got time. Why not I just do it right now? <laughs> I don't like to put off tomorrow what I can do today. Now, that's assuming that this thing's even sort of in tune. It's probably close enough for me. <laughs> Actually, it does sound like it might be just a hair off, but let me, uh, let me, let me just check it real quick. It won't take but a second, I don't think. I'm pretty fast at tuning. Actually, it's quite off. Go through it one more time real quick. That's close enough for who it's for. <laughs> yeah, the Vine Covered Church. Um, hands are cold and they're dry and it's really hard to hold the pick. <laughs> I do it in the key of A. Let's see here. I better turn this way so I don't overdrive the microphone. kick it. I don't remember. I don't remember how I kick it right now. You won't find it on a well-traveled highway, not even on a dusty gravel road. And you have to want to be there when you find it. It's not on any maps I know. Out across the field through the pasture You climb along the steep and rocky trail And when you cross that little creek in the valley You'll see that vine-covered church on the hill That vine-covered church above the valley Where the congregation gathered to pray Built with their hands from the forest Now stands as a marker for the grave
And when I, you know, it, the end of the song there, it still stands as a marker for their graves. That's why the guy said I needed to change the words in the song because it no longer stood there as of just the day before I sang it for the very first time. They tore it down the day before. It just sent chills up my neck. I ain't kidding you. So, anyway, now, and, you know, I mentioned that that was the only song I've ever had recorded by a national act, and that's true uh, as far as I know. And, um, but I have had quite a few other songs recorded by other local groups and things. You know, so there's been a lot of people recorded, uh, you know, Grandpa's Old Fiddle and tunes like that. I've also gotten the most requests for Grandpa's Old Fiddle over the years, and uh, I've also heard all kinds of neat stories about that, too, that uh, people that have bought the albums have told me later, you know, that uh, they, uh, different stories about, you know, catching their husbands or their wives or somebody crying because they, of that song. <clears throat> but anyway, um, th so thank you for the request there. Um, let's see here. Do we have any more questions? Going down, I'm looking for question marks primarily. It looks like Lester Cunningham. Jerry, can you show or explain how your w uh, wood furnace and blower system works? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do that again, Lester. I have done it before. It's been a long time. But uh, I'll just tell you very quickly how it actually works, and then I'll try to show you a little bit better about this with a little short video, maybe tomorrow. Um, but essentially, the, the wood furnace sits out be, uh, all by itself, and um, it's got, a, I think, 400 gallons of water in there. And the, 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 the wood heats the water to 185 degrees. There's a circulating pump that pumps all the time, and it just continually circulates the water from, from the wood furnace all the way underground into the house and through an A-coil in the furnace. And actually, in my case, two furnaces. There's two separate furnaces. Both of them have an A-coil. Both of them have a water pipe going to them, and that hot water is circulating continually, one, you know, 24-7, continually circling, circling through those A-coils. So, and, and, and then it circulates back. After it goes through both A-coils, then it goes back out to the wood furnace. And um, then it gets reheated, and it circulates back through the furnace, and it just continually does that. Just one continuous loop, it does it 24-7. As long as you've got it turned on and got heat going, you know. So then... On the inside of the house, there's no difference between any other heat source. Uh, in other words, you know how you just go over to your thermostat and you turn it up to 70 degrees or whatever you want it to set at. That thermostat sends the signal back to the furnaces to just kick their blowers on. That's all it does. That's all a thermostat does anyway. It just, well, I mean, it does a little bit more in, in your typical gas situation is it kicks the gas on also but in this case all it really does is just kick the blowers on because the, the 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 a coils are already at temperature they're already hot so all you got to do is just kick the blowers on and it's very efficient and it, it blows it out so you know when i guess that's the other cost that you do have you have the cost to run the blowers um, and the cost to run the little circulating pump so there's a little bit more cost to it, but it's still almost free heat compared to gas or compared to electric or anything like that. You would go broke in a heartbeat trying to heat this house with gas. That's And everybody did. I mean, I don't have to prove that case. Everybody from the 60s on went broke here trying to heat this house. Everybody did. Every single person that I've heard any stories about definitely went broke here trying to heat it. That's why from day one, I made up my mind that I wasn't even going to turn the gas furnaces on. And we don't. I mean, we do occasionally. I mean, like really, really occasionally we will have them on. But we hardly ever turn the gas furnaces on. Hardly ever. Maybe once per year for a day or something, you know, if, if that. And, and honestly, for the last several years, I don't think I've turned them on at all. But... Uh, 
So it, it's a ton of work, but that's how it works. It's a very simple situation, really. Now, the one negative that I see, and, and these companies that installed it, they told me that, oh, you, you, know, uh, you put this uh, insulated uh, pipe in the ground, you know, and it runs from the furnace all the way into the, into the house, and he says, it's completely insulated. You'll never see any heat loss on that. Yeah, baloney. Uh, you know, if there's snow on the ground, because mine, I couldn't bury it very deep just because there's another culvert pipe going through there, you know, where the creek runs under the house. It's just, it's complicated. My life is always complicated. I never get to do the easy thing. If I could have buried it a lot deeper, of course, I probably wouldn't see this. But for sure, I can see heat loss on that pipe. Like if there's snow on the ground, there will be no snow in that line where the pipe goes. So I'm losing heat in the ground uh, on that circulating water. And I wish I had a way to insulate that better. It would almost be worth digging it up to insulate it better if I could. But I don't know any way to do that. I mean, it's a big round... It's a big round uh, uh, styrofoam filled pipe with two, one one hot water going and one hot water coming back. So in other words, it's a big thing filled with styrofoam with one uh, send and one return uh, water line inside of that. It loses heat. They, they, They claim it didn't lose any heat. Well, I got news for you. It loses heat. There's no doubt about it. So, uh, which if I didn't lose that heat, that would probably make a significant difference. Really, it, it, I don't know. It, in the scheme of things, it might save me two or three loads of wood, <laughs> you know. But two or three loads of wood ain't really much when you consider how much I cut. You know, you, I know most people would think two or three loads of wood's a big, big uh, job. Uh, not for me. Uh, two or three loads of wood is just enough to get by for a week yeah it's hard to explain <laughs> it's it's just people just can't relate to it they really can't until they see it i'm looking to see where i wow it looks like uh okay there's been quite a few more questions i'm going to try to get through them because we're running late here Janet Harris, can we see your furnace? Yeah, I'll show that tomorrow. I'll, I'll, uh, and tomorrow's going to be what would ordinarily be our shop talk day. I'm just going to call it a regular vlog from this point on. But in tomorrow's vlog, I will um, try to have a, a pretty thorough thing of the whole furnace and uh, how it works on the inside and all that too. I'll just show you pictures of it, a uh, video of it or something. <clears throat> Wavy Gravy, I can't seem to post anything this morning. Wonder why. Um, I don't have an answer on that one. Uh, you might have to restart your computer sometimes, stuff like that, or restart your application at least, if not your whole computer. That would be my only suggestion at this point. Backstory family history. Steph Gormley, did you or Leon ever know or jam with Hugh Carroll? Famous melodic banjo player from North Carolina. He went by Carol Best. I don't think I ever heard that name. I don't think so. So sorry, I don't think so. And I, I you know, Leon might have possibly known him, but I, I, I don't know. Uh, Bruce Ducker. Oh, see, no, okay, I'm looking for question marks now. I got to remember to look for question marks. Here we go. Um, Lester Cunningham, thanks uh, you for explanation. Oh, you're welcome. Bill Webb, good morning from Texas, home of World Series champions Texas Rangers. Huh, that's cool. Uh, so Bill, is, he's been here quite a few times. The last time Bill was here, he gave my wife a, a ceramic kiln. Uh, we're going to have to get some parts for it to get it to work, but I, I think we can get it to work. So thanks again, Bill, for that. Um, and that's one more thing on my to-do list. i got to put that on there, too. <laughs> so I've got to put on the dump truck and that kiln on there. Yeah, yeah, it's just not easy being me. I know you guys still don't believe that, but it's true. It's just not easy being me. 
Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, is there some unique conversations going on that I can't quite make out what they mean and stuff, so I'm not going to mention those. Michael Johnson, Jerry has some great videos from the past on the furnace. Well worth looking at them up. I'll I'll uh, I'll give you a little bit better view of it tomorrow. I'll just I'll just make that a little short video f to include in tomorrow's uh, vlog. So we'll do that. Thank you all for uh, tuning in this morning. 164 at the moment. Uh, we will um, be back bright and early tomorrow, eight o'clock. Uh, bring your uh, questions and comments and things, and we'll just have a good time. We'll see you then. Thank you.